Thank you, everyone. So it's my great pleasure, and I should just introduce who I am, just so that it makes sense why I'm, I've got the, the, the privilege of introducing Anne. So my name is Sarah Ansari. I'm currently the president of the Royal Asiatic Society, and one of the perks of the job... Oh. Oh, that's okay. I thought, is there a bird in here? No. Um, one of the perks of the one of the perks of the job is to be able to attend book launches like this and to be able to introduce the authors. So I'm sure that most people in the room know exactly who Anne is, but for the record, and for people maybe online who are less familiar. I'm just going to spend a few moments introducing Anne's life, career, achievements, and so forth, before I hand over to Anne to take charge of the evening and speak to us about her book that we're launching here this evening. So after studying for an undergraduate and then postgraduate degree at Lady Margaret Hall, Oxford, and then taking a postgraduate political science course or set of courses in the US, Anne took one for the team and opted for the civil service um, and not a prospective history lectureship. Um, apart from a brief interlude as a writer for the US section of The Economist, she then proceeded to spend most of her career in what was at the time the Department of Trade and Industry, advising ministers on a range of policy issues, negotiating with the European Union, and running a regulatory body in the financial services sector. Always keenly interested in history, Anne was delighted when a hitherto undiscovered and potentially very interesting trove of, of private papers came her way. Particularly fascinating for an ex-civil servant was the window that these um, opened on the workings of government, revealing the scope for a determined individual to operate the system in order to deliver results, if in a rather different context. Do come and sit down, please. There's spaces at the other end of the room. So Anne has been working on these papers since around 2009, drawing on them to test out ideas in articles for the, Royal, um, the Journal of the Royal Asiatic Society, so the journal that the Royal Asiatic Society produces, and also the British Journal of Middle Eastern Studies. And she tells us that it took her two years to complete the manuscript for the book, which actually is pretty good going. In, her, in my experience, I think she did very well to get it done in two years. And the book, you can see its wonderful cover on the screen in front of you. Um, Britain's Man on the Spot in Iraq and Afghanistan, Government and Diplomacy by Sir Henry Dobbs. Um, at the age of, at the apex of empire, sorry, published late last year. So in a nutshell, just to repeat, the book draws on this new source material that came Anne's way from the Dobbs family archive to reveal new insights into Dobbs's career in what was a period of remarkable change, both locally in that part of the world, but also, I think, you know, with a ripple effect for places beyond you know, Afghanistan and Iraq. That's my, my introduction. As I said, probably not needed, bearing in mind that people know her very well in this room. But I'm going to hand over now to Anne, who's going to talk to us about the book, introduce it really to us, and lure us into its um, content. So over to you, Anne. Well, thank you very much, Sarah, for your kind words. Um, good evening, everyone. It's a great pleasure to see you all here tonight, especially on such a horrid evening. Thank you for coming. I particularly appreciate being invited to hold my book launch by this distinguished society, which celebrated its bicentenary last year. I'm especially pleased because it was two of its fellows who encouraged me to persist the publication. Professor Francis Robinson, a past president, and Derek Davis, a longtime council member. To Derek, who sadly died in July, I owe a great deal. He generously offered many constructive and scholarly comments and on my efforts, and very important to me, was his firmly held view that Sir Henry Dobbs needed to find his rightful place in the record. 
my book seeks to place him there. Its main focus is on events during the peak of Henry Dobbs' career from 1919 to 21, when he was Foreign Secretary to the Government of India, and from 1922 to 29, when he was Britain's High Commissioner for Iraq. Today, I will outline his main achievements, their significance, and how he delivered them. I also want to give examples from the book of how his strengths and his often unusual approach affected the results he got. Sir Henry's greatest achievement was his role in shaping the modern Middle East. This was through the significant part he played in the establishment of an independent Iraq. Iraq, formerly Mesopotamia, was the only territory in the former Ottoman Empire to secure independence before the Second World War. The British Secretary of State, to whom Dobbs reported most, Leo Amory, commented on the extraordinary difficulties of creating an independent country comprising desert, swamp, and wild mountain ranges, while jarring elements made the inhabitants conscious only of their differences, and where the British found themselves in the midst of political conflict and facing strong nationalist opposition. The establishment of this new state had taken place over only 13 years, and Dobbs, the longest serving High Commissioner, had been in charge for over six. His great work, as Amory called it, in Iraq, followed his successful negotiations with the Afghans when he was head of the British mission to Kabul. In highly unpropitious circumstances, the Henry had eventually concluded the enduring 1921 treaty between Afghanistan and British India, later Pakistan. This gave the British what they needed and settled the relationship between these two countries until the 1970s. Notwithstanding encomiums from contemporaries, Sir Henry Dobbs has remained largely unknown, except the specialists, unlike, for example, his colorful contemporary, Gertrude Bell, who shared his views on Mesopotamia and its future. Here is Gertrude in her younger days, probably about the time Henry Dobbs met her in London and well before their encounters in Mesopotamia. By then, she was 48 and Dobbs was 45. Gertrude remained as Oriental Secretary in Iraq's High Commission when Sir Henry took over. They usually lunched together at the residency. She admired him greatly for his courageous dispatches, for his plans for large-scale works, and as a considerable administrator. Henry Dobbs' lack of visibility can largely be explained by the absence until now of any significant source. And to, to supplement the official record and shed light on his contribution. However, his recently discovered letters and papers have made it possible to bring Dobbs out of the shadows and reveal the significance of his role. His papers were found when Sir Henry's last surviving child died and his family house in Ireland passed to his great-grandson and my husband's nephew, Henry Wilkes. This is Dobbs' house in Ireland as it is these days. Henry Wilkes unlocked a small room opening off the back stairs to find seven sizable trunks filled with piles of family papers and photographs, 
untouched for over 80 years. <laughs> and this is our first sight of the Dobbs papers. The papers included some 300 letters from Henry Dobbs to his mother and around 460 to his wife. There were also miscellaneous other papers and correspondence, some with ministers and senior officials. Rather poignantly, Dobbs' wife, Esme, had lovingly sorted out his letters to her by date and tied them together in bundles with either ribbon or tape. Here are Henry and Esme at their wedding in Lahore on the 4th of March, 1907. They had met in India and he commented just afterwards, we knew so little of each other. They quickly became extremely fond of each other as their voluminous correspondence shows, and Dobbs soon began to confide in his wife. Periodically, he would sharply criticize the official stance and describe unauthorized actions he had risked taking in his efforts to deliver British policy aims. Often apart, when she was in Ireland with their children, they constantly wrote to each other. Their letters build up a picture of Dobbs' outlook, his motivation, his tactics. His papers also offer fresh insights into various important events, as well as colourful and amusing descriptions of key protagonists. They form the backbone of my book, and the intention is to make them publicly available. What then was it about Henry Dobbs? that made him so effective. As a new recruit to the Indian civil service, he quickly became fascinated by Indian and other Eastern cultures. He always looked for opportunities to explore them further by traveling and by talking to the people he met wherever he was, whether in local opium dens or princely palaces. In all his posts, he liked to go out and about to see for himself, to hear what people had to say, talk to the tribal leaders, and sort out local problems like land disputes, water rights, and revenue assessment. Empathetic, he got to know those he governed and their ways, and he was sympathetic to their needs and aspirations. Here he is in Baluchistan, surrounded by local chiefs. He had a great respect for them. Wherever Henry Dobbs was, his interest and curiosity attributed insights to the very well-informed judgments he made. His observations also led him from time to our time to ask himself whether the British approach had made people any better or any happier. Dobbs was also on the look always on the lookout for opportunities to improve the local economy. In Baluchistan, he developed fruit production. He imported merino sheep at his own expense, raised the quality of the wool from the flocks kept by the tribes. He bought maize seed from America and Egyptian clover to increase yields. He introduced olives for the production of olive oil and bees for honey. Perhaps his most original idea was to create a spa around a sulfur spring to treat rheumatism sufferers. And he hoped that this spa would lead the Quetta doctors to promote it. 
He also succeeded in getting resources switched from the administration of regulations, which he saw as irrelevant to much needed road improvements. Henry Dobbs delivered both for the communities he served and for the British government whose representative he was. This required an understanding of the local situation and also the wider international context. He appreciated earlier and saw more clearly than most the implications of the fundamental changes that had been accelerated by the cataclysm of the First World War. When Dobbs embarked on his career in 1892, Britain was regarded as the leading world power. Its empire covered a quarter of the Earth's land mass and included a fifth of its population. After the First World War, in Britain itself, there was little appetite for foreign adventures, either among the electorate or in the cash-strapped British government. At the same time, the people Britain governed from Ireland to India, places in between, were seeking a greater say over their own affairs. The increasing momentum behind self-determination was now being recognized by British and allied governments and posed a challenge to traditional imperial methods of control. Henry Dobbs was sensitive to these trends and recognized that in the post-war world, Britain's best hope of maintaining influence was through establishing friendly relations with the newly emerging states rather than seeking to rule them. <clears throat> this approach aligned closely with Dobbs' own preference for engaging with local communities and their leaders. He well understood the ambitions of the Emir of Afghanistan and the first king of Iraq, Faisal, for their countries. He sympathized with their wish to be on a par with sovereign European states and their rulers. Dobbs appreciated that in the post-imperial world, retaining goodwill of these new leaders would be the best way of increasing influence and advancing British interests rather than and by rather than by imposing British systems on reluctant inhabitants. As well as the perceptive understanding that informed his work, Henry Dobbs' various personal qualities were key to his effectiveness. He was independent-minded and dogged in defending his approach to get what he saw as the right result. In 1916, while Henry Dobbs was in Mesopotamia, this led to bitter disagreements with Sir Percy Cox, head of the civil administration, and to whom he was then reporting. British forces had invaded Mesopotamia when the Allies declared war on its Ottoman rulers, and a civil administration was set up behind the advancing British army. Here is picture of its head, Sir Percy Cox, taken a few years later, possibly around the time that Henry Dobbs succeeded him as Iraq's High Commissioner. Cox, supported by Arnold Wilson, pressed ahead with a policy of Indianization. They looked to impose in Mesopotamia British Indian regulations and codes administered by personnel from India. Henry Dobbs pointed out that such changes risked causing total confusion among local inhabitants over what rights they had, and he insisted on continuing to use existing Ottoman systems 
and took on such local officials as remained. This was more practical and cheaper. Furthermore, Dobbs preferred to work through local tribal leaders, in part because of the importance he attached to having the big men on side, which he saw both as a more effective way of administering the region and also because it was important to building future friendly relations. Dobbs knew that Cox's approach ran against the pressure from London over many years to expand native participation in the government of British India. He was also well aware that in addition, Indianization was now at odds with the increasing support within government in London for self-government. Dobbs also knew that a change of legal systems in an occupied as opposed to a conquered and annexed territory, not compatible with the Hague Convention. His greatest concern though, was that causing needless offense to influential persons would risk stirring up action against the British, especially by disillusioned Arab nationalists. Dobbs, now back in India, was writing to Bert Gertrude Bell, arguing in January 1918 that you must set up some system of self-government in Iraq. Interested in returning, Dobbs refused to do so while the policies he opposed continued. Sadly, the approach he advocated did not prevail soon enough and nationalist disappointment was indeed a factor in the serious disturbances during the Iraq revolt of 1920. Dobbs' tenaciousness, combined with his readiness to take risks and unauthorized action, was frequently a key element in his successes. This is shown by an episode early in his career. Soon after his first appointment to a frontier area, as he told his mother, he nearly caused war with Afghanistan. Keen to protect the interests of the communities he was responsible for, he held as hostage the commander of the Afghan frontier post until his subordinates returned the 400 camels and their attendants which they had taken from British Indian territory. Afghan troops nearly attacked, to try and rescue their commander. However, Dobbs had the imaginative idea of pointing out to the commander that he risked having his hands and feet cut off by the Arn Amir Abdul Rahman, victorious for his ruthless cruelty because the commander had allowed himself to be captured. The camels were at once returned and the commander released. Dobbs commented, I see no reason why we should meekly submit to the depredations of the Emir's subjects as we have in the past. Henry Dobbs often showed considerable physical courage this was much in evidence in Mesopotamia after the British retreat following the Battle of Ctesiphon in November 1915. Dobbs set out on tour among the sheikhs who dominated the Marsh Arabs. Some were in the pay of the Turks who were trying to stir them up against the British. In these circumstances, Dobbs thought it calming to go on administering, settling disputes, and demanding revenue as if nothing had happened. The area was extremely remote and difficult to access, even by boat. Dobbs took no guard, so as to seem quite confident, and entrusted himself to Arab escorts. He also undertook to find out more from the army 
or the army from the sheikhs about Turkish activities. His official responsibilities provided excellent cover for gathering intelligence. Dobbs, who was running a temperature of over 104 degrees Fahrenheit, continued his visits undaunted. And I wanted to try and illustrate how traveling among the Marsh Arabs might have looked to Henry Dobbs. Taken in 1910, this shows the village with the Sheikh's Reed House. Dobbs stayed in one or two of these and traditional boats, which he sometimes traveled in. Henry Dobbs had to call on many of these personal attributes, in particular, patience, firmness, and shrewd judgment when later he, had, he led a delegation to negotiate a treaty between British India and Afghanistan. Afghanistan had long been seen as a security threat because it offered a gateway for Russia to invade British India and because of unruly tribes on both sides of the Indo-Afghan border. The treaty was to settle issues which were outstanding since the end of the Third Afghan War in 1919. As chief British negotiator, and now Sir Henry, his previous experience of working with the Afghans, with border tribes, and in frontier areas was to prove invaluable. Dobbs faced a most unenviable opening position. Although it was the Afghans who had sued for peace, his predecessor as the chief British negotiator had quickly agreed to what Amir Amanullah and his ministers most wanted. This was for the Afghans to take back control of their external relations from British India. For the previous 40 years, the Amirs had accepted British India's prohibition on their dealing directly with foreign powers. In 1919, the British failure even to ask for anything in return for conceding control led the Afghans to think them very weak. The Afghans at once sought to exploit their newfound freedom to play Britain off against Soviet Russia with whom they also opened treaty negotiations. The difficulties of Dobbs' position were greatly increased by disagreements between London and Delhi. His negotiating instructions had to be agreed by the Viceroy and by the Secretary of State for India in London, who was ultimately responsible. The newly appointed Viceroy, Lord Reading, advised by his cautious senior official, was persuaded that failure to agree a treaty would be a disaster for India. He therefore supported offering British India's traditional subsidy to Afghanistan and making constant concessions to secure an agreement. Edwin Montague, Secretary of State, was less persuaded of the ill results of a rupture and supported a much more robust line. The Henry saw two issues as critical control of the tribes on the frontier and not allowing the Russians to establish consulates on the borders of British India from where they could encourage tribal uprising. <laughs> Dobbs and his team spent 11 months in Kabul exploring the possibility of reaching a satisfactory agreement with the Afghans. And here are the British and Afghan delegations at Kabul. During those months, matters were greatly complicated by constant shifts in the international situation, changes in the Afghans' negotiating position, 
and the disagreements and delays over Dobbs negotiating instructions. The instructions never arrived in time for him to take advantage of any favorable turn of events. There were frequent standoffs. Several times, Dobbs threatened to end the discussions, and on at least three occasions, he prepared to leave, summoning the necessary transport to Kabul. But the Afghans always reconsidered. Throughout this long period, the British delegation socialized with the Afghans, unlike the Russian mission who kept themselves to themselves. Eventually, the Emir agreed to consider a draft treaty of which he had previously refused to look because he said it gave no benefits to Afghanistan. Here is Amir Amanullah. Dobbs then got authority to agree terms on the spot with the Emir and negotiated alone with him in Persian over three days. The result was the enduring Anglo-Afghan Treaty of 1921 that gave British India what it needed without paying any subsidy. It excluded Russian consulates from the borders and covered other arrangements. Tribal issues were dealt with in a side letter. The head of the India office in London commented, the treaty is indeed a triumph and a rich reward for the incredible patience and endurance which you have shown during the last year and of your skill in handling these contrary ruffians. The treaty was well received by both the Viceroy and the press. The Henry's next and last role was to be his most testing and also his most influential. As Britain's High Commissioner in Iraq, where he succeeded Sir Percy Cox, he was responsible for delivering Britain's responsibility under the Mandate system. This system applied to former Ottoman and German imperial territories, such as Iraq, and had been set up by the Allies at the Versailles Peace Talks. It was to be supervised by the Allies' newly created League of Nations. The system provided for Iraq's independence to be provisionally recognized under the guidance of a mandatory power until the League decided it could stand alone. In 1920, the British government accepted responsibility for Iraq as its mandatory power. Dobbs would need to draw on the many strengths he had already demonstrated. In order to advance Iraq, with Mosul included, towards independence, while at the same time maintaining good relations between the emerging independent country and the British government. Critical elements in his successes were his skills as a shrewd negotiator and a daring operator, together with his sympathy for Iraqi aspirations. So Henry arrived in Baghdad in 1922 at what the colonial secretary, Leo Amory, later described as a moment of extraordinary difficulty and uncertainty. In Britain, the cabinet was debating whether to give up the mandate for Iraq. The popular press's quit Iraq campaign had strong support and the British government had won the 1922 election on a policy of non-intervention abroad and drastic cuts in expenditure. A divided cabinet took until April 1923 to decide that the British would remain in Iraq. Both Dobbs and his predecessor Cox believed that the continuing unpopularity of the decision to stay 
created a real possibility that the British would leave. In Iraq, the conditions of the mandate were so hated that these were dressed up as a treaty. King Faisal, charismatic leader of the 1916 Arab revolt, but with no roots in Iraq, had accepted the throne from the British on condition that he had the support of the Iraqi people. King Faisal, in this picture, which he presented in its handsome frame to Sir Henry. King Faisal had sound, signed the treaty with the support of his government in the belief that it offered the fastest route to independence, but on the condition that it was approved by an Iraqi constituent assembly. Both the British government and the League of Nations required assembly, the assembly to endorse it. The League also had to be satisfied that approval of the treaty had been secured through an independent democratic process. Sir Henry and his predecessor were firmly convinced that any apparent unwillingness on the part of the Iraqis to accept the treaty and associated agreements would be seen as an absence of Iraqi support that would give the British government a welcome excuse to leave, and therefore no changes could be considered. Faisal recognised that Iraq needed British support to secure its borders and resist Turkish claims to northern Iraq. At the same time, he encouraged Iraqi nationalist politicians in an attempt to demonstrate his independence from the British and raise his local standing. When the assembly met on the 27th of March, 1924, there were nationalist demonstrations outside the assembly and inside vociferous criticisms from the many treaty opponents. Particularly controversial were the terms defining the respective responsibilities of the two governments for financial, military, and administrative arrangements. Dobbs was adamant that no amendments to the treaty could be made, and the assembly continued to reviews, refuse its support unless they were. Deadlock was soon reached. The Henry then ignored recommendations from the colonial office which he thought would inflame the situation and instead followed his own unauthorized stratagems. He wrote anonymously in the Baghdad Times that the British would like to abandon Iraq in favor of a base in Kuwait or an alliance with Iban Saud. He started a rumor that if the treaty was rejected, the British would ignore Iraq's claims to territory in the north and make their own bargain with Turkey. In the face of increasing unrest, pleas from the king, from leading politicians, and from assembly members for changes to the treaty, but still no instructions from London, Dobbs told Faisal that if the treaty was <clears throat> If the treaty was not accepted by the deadline of 11th June, British support for him would not continue unless he dissolved the assembly. By then, the 11th June deadline was only a few hours away. Faisal's officials got assembly members together and to the astonishment of all, the treaty without amendment was passed half an hour before the midnight deadline. Much later, Sir Henry was thanked in the Iraqi press for convincing his government not to evacuate Iraq. He told his wife it was the most difficult situation he had ever handled, and that what he had done was to pull the moon out of the bottom of the sea. But Iraq now had continuing British support and one important precondition for League of Nations recognition had been satisfied. 
Another was that Iraq should have settled frontiers. Iraq's northern boundary and its claim to Mosul was being disputed by Turkey, led by the aggressive and successful general Mustafa Kemal, later known as Ataturk. Securing these disputed areas, effectively the northern third of Iraq, was a top priority for King Faisal and his government, while Sir Henry believed Iraq would hardly be viable without them. Dobbs had immediately weighted the position in Iraq's favour with his bold decisions made soon after his arrival in Mag Baghdad. Ministers in London were nervous about any potential conflict with Ataturk, but as Iraq's High Commissioner, Sir Henry was also commander-in-chief. And there he is reviewing the troops. Without reference to London, Dobbs authorised British forces to retake the territory which pro-Turkish elements had seized in the disputed northern area. This also forestalled incursions by Turkish troops assembled on the border. Re-establishing Iraqi control just before international negotiations with Turkey restarted in April 1923, when the status quo would be frozen, had given Iraq a key advantage. The negotiations to settle Iraq's northern frontier, which had began at Lausanne, took until June 1926 to conclude. They moved to the League of Nations. The League set up a commission to establish local inhabitants' wishes. This recommended that Iraq should include all the province of Mosul, but Mustafa Kemal's representatives vetoed their recommendation. On Dobbs' advice, Leo Amory then refused to accept either the Council of the League's recommendation to halve the territory with Turkey or their alternative of arbitration at the International Court at The Hague. Turkey had never previously respected its decisions. Bilateral negotiations then followed. You can see from this map that the northern area was a large part of Iraq's inhabitable territory. The League's proposal would have brought Turkey's frontier south, to just north of Kirkuk, along the lower that which I've circled in red. Dobbs knew that the British representative, Sir Ronald Lindsay, thought the Turks would not settle for less than half the disputed territory. Sir Henry was convinced they were bluffing. He therefore went to London and persuaded the government to instruct Lindsay not to give away any territory, but to be ready to offer a payment. The Turks conceded all the disputed territory for half a million, and Dobbs' assessment of the Turkish position was further vindicated during a subsequent two-hour discussion with Mustafa Kemal. With a mix. Henry had got two major obstacles to Iraq independence removed by securing the ratification of the 1922 Anglo-Iraqi Treaty and by settling Iraq's northern border with Turkey. Dobbs always prophesied that once Faisal and his government <coughs> no longer felt threatened by Turkey, British disagreements with the Iraqis would become more difficult to resolve. Faisal now felt secure enough to press much more aggressively for Iraq's early independence, which Dobbs was in fact doing all he could to advance. The King and his defence minister, Nuri al-Sayed, 
were also pushing to create a large army through conscription. Dobbs opposed these plans as expensive and unnecessary and likely to arouse resistance and unrest among the tribes. More worrying for the High Commissioner, King Faisal had always kicked against constraints on his powers imposed by the constitutional and legal framework, which were league requirements. Dobbs' fear was that the King would use the army to sweep these aside. Dobbs' fears played out differently. It was the generals and not the King who used the army to take control of the state. Unfortunately, another of Dobbs' concerns, the position of minorities, was also well-founded. After he had left Iraq, in a speech Sir Henry gave in February 1933, he asked whether the British had sacrificed our very honour by abandoning the Kurds and the Assyrian Christians. Although administrative and legal protection for minorities had been put in place and had satisfied the League of Nations, this did not prevent later atrocities being committed against them by the Iraqi army. During his last two years in Iraq, Dobbs found it increasingly difficult to make the progress towards Iraq's early independence, which Faisal and his government desperately wanted and which Dobbs himself thought the British government should do their best to deliver. He was especially worried that British delays would put at risk the main object of British policy, namely to establish an independent Iraq, friendly and bound by ties of obligation to HM government. The delays were certainly souring Dobbs' hitherto good relations with Faisal. Indeed, the British government's earlier policy aims of saving costs and making a quick exit from Iraq had been replaced by a wish to remain to protect developing British economic interests, notably in oil and air rooms. Dobbs remarked despairingly that the British seemed to want to stick here permanently. He failed to get a categorical assurance from the government to put forward Iraq for full membership of the League in 1928 or even in 1932. And here is Sir Henry in reflective mood taken after his retirement. Neither Sir Henry Dobbs nor his successors got anywhere until a Labour government was elected in May 1929. Dobbs, now retired, went immediately to London to put the case for Iraq's early independence to the new colonial secretary who publicly acknowledged Sir Henry's share in pressing a more liberal policy upon His Majesty's government. On the 3rd of October, 1932, an independent Iraq was accepted as a member of the League of Nations. Despite the impasse over independence, when Dobbs left Iraq in early 1929, King Faisal described him as a sincere highest honour. He was also much praised in the Arab press. Both the press and Iraqi politicians recognised his efforts to arrive at a policy that was in the best interest of Iraq as well as Britain. The colonial secretary to whom Dobbs had mostly reported, Leo Amory, later commented that, to have carried out without impairment of friendship the transition from direct British administration to Iraq independence was a remarkable triumph of statecraft. 
Dobbs' letters cast new light on significant events and reveal how an empathetic and determined man on the spot is <laughs> able to shape events. Often quoted in my book, the letters give us insights into Henry Dobbs' thoughts and provide graphic accounts of his actions. His life and work offer an interesting counterpoint to conventional colonial stereotypes. Thank you. I think on behalf of all of us, I mean, I was totally spellbound and I think the room, I mean, there was a hush in the room. We were hanging on your every word, Anne. It was a brilliant, brilliant introduction to somebody who's been such a big part of your life for a fairly long time now. So I think you're happy to take some questions oh, if I'm people do. Um, and I see a hand has gone up already. I'll do my best. To and another you. one, so first, and then off to you. So uh, do you remember what we said just about? Yes. So if I let you come into the microphone. I'm, I'm not sure I got this. I'm not sure I got this. Quite okay. It's fine. It'll it's be, fine. it's it fine. fine. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much, John. I love it. Absolutely. I have slept out often with the stars of the most of the night. And your phrasing calls for the way. You can have criticism, which I haven't, you haven't said much about the way you do. Um, well, that, so it's a question. Sorry, yeah, sorry. It's, a quest, it's a question about, because I was giving a eulogy of uh, Henry Dobbs, you might say, and do I have criticisms of him? Um, well, I, I mean, I'm sure I do, but I'm trying to bring them to the front of my mind at the moment. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> um, he did, well, uh, I think he, well, he, I find it in the context of the times, I suppose I gave him really a pretty good mark because he was so effective and so imaginative and so ahead of his times. And I'm trying to think of something he really did get wrong. I think he had some rather funny ideas about um, Indian native princes. I think he thought that uh, the, the, uh, the native princes should be given more power, and I should think that was rather debatable. But um, I, I'm afraid I, I haven't given the attention I should to provide a more balanced view, perhaps. <laughs> Could I could I just follow up before I go to the next question, which is you said he was ahead of his time. Yes. But that raises all sorts of questions as to why, I mean how. In a sense, did you get a feel from your work on him? What 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 formed him as an individual, a character that was was not conventional in 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 key ways? At at that time, I think it was his complete fascination and his liking for. The, um, the communities and societies in which he lived and their culture, and he took a great interest in that. And, uh, and he learned all these different languages. I know that was quite common then, but he, and he spoke to people in their own languages and liked to discuss with them what their problems were. And I, I well, I don't, I, it's difficult to say, but I, I think that was, was sort of what probably drove him because, and he had terrific <clears throat> respect and liking for their ways and for their culture. And uh, he, uh, Britain had spread a sanitary peace and that it, you know, I think he didn't actually say, but in this quotation, he, I got well, from his letters, I had the impression that he would have liked the buildings to have been left more as they were. I think it was over here. Was it? Yes, you were the next one. Very, very enlightening thing about the But my question is about Leo Avery. I had to do some work on Leo Avery for the European. And I wondered how, how did he enjoy the Avery relationship? Was it just an ambassador to Boston? Or was it a more friendly one? Did he come back? 
too often, do you see? Um, so it's just the question is... The, the question yeah. is about the relationship between Leo Amory and Dobbs. Um, I think he, um, well, he was quite happy, as he was throughout his career, to be at some distance. <laughs> and uh, he thought that Leo Amory was much too jingoistic for his taste, and that is actually a quote from him. Um, and he had enormous difficulties with him in the latter part of his period as High Commissioner, because Leo Amory and the Conservatives were very reluctant to uh, g give up um, any uh, control over Iraq because of the uh, extremely high and increasing economic stakes that were developing there. I think Lionel, the back. Yeah. Just to explore anything, uh, quick Indian principles, anything which think about independence, if you would, in the uh, policy. I mean, presumably, we wouldn't be allowed to. I mean, Britain wouldn't tolerate what you might call genuine independence, I presume. That the external sovereignty of Iraq would have to be in some way uh, modified in Britain's disposal, which sounds very much like an Indian principle state. Is, am I off the track there? I, I don't, sorry, the, um, you were asking about the um, degree of independence that Iraq might have and whether they would be really basically kept as subordinate by Britain, is that? So like a, yeah. like a princely state. Like and a princely state. A lot of internal independence, but uh, external sovereignties restricted uh, or what, what, not allowed. I think, and, uh, well, you're, and you're drawing a distinction between the sort of internal uh, affairs and external affairs. But I think, uh, in fact, it's, a, it's very interesting what you've just raised, because if I was making criticism of Dobbs, I think he wasn't very enlightened about attitudes in India or developing, um, developing, moving towards independence in India. That he seemed to, he he. he there's no, I I don't have any evidence that he was sort of pushing that. Whereas in Iraq, he definitely did think that there should be self-government and they should be independent. And I think that he, I well, from what I've read, my impression is that he was he was expecting them to have total independence, including over foreign affairs, but that with the goodwill and the what I might call their enlightened self-interest would be what would drive their relationship with Britain. So that in his perhaps idealized view, they would want to have good relations with Britain and that in fact they would for quite a time be dependent on Britain and so that in practical terms uh, that would shape the relationship between them. Right, it's a small question, and uh, it's about primary evidence and so on. Does he have anything to say in his papers about uh, either being troubled by the great post-war flu pandemic or in these instances of Mrs. Paul? Well, it's interesting you asked that because the answer to that is no, and I was always very surprised. And uh, he did mention the odd person who died from it, <laughs> but other than that, I didn't read any comments. No, he was born in London and educated at Winchester. Um, well, he was, he thought of himself as an Irish man, but I think it was, sorry, I should have said. No, I mean, yeah, carry on. He, it was, of course, rather different then because the whole of Ireland was part of Britain, if you like. I was just wondering if the fact that he considered himself an Irish man gave him a sort of a more stand when he was negotiating for the I don't think so, because I don't think at that time he drew a distinction between being an Irishman and 
being with the British, that's my impression. I mean, I think, yes, if we think about what's happening in Ireland at the time and the fact that that's a kind of pivotal moment, isn't it, in yes. terms of Ireland's own sort of independence, I suppose somebody in his position in a way straddles worlds. But, I mean, I, I appreciate that a lot of people living through that still saw themselves very much as British, particularly if they were representing British government in different ways. And perhaps I should quote his sister's comment on him, which she said, I'm afraid my brother doesn't understand Ireland. He hasn't lived here at all. <laughs> Question at the far end of the room. Can you tell us more about his personal relationship with the Emir camp? We've seen for the last many years, and didn't the Emir camp be the set in his way? Oh, that was, that sorry. Uh, yes, I was asked about um, Dobbs' relationship with the Emir of Afghanistan. And that was his relationship, not with Amin Mullah, but with his father, Habibullah. And he did indeed develop uh, quite a close relationship with Habibullah, whom uh, he, and Habibullah and he, Got on very well. He was Dobbs was earlier in his career on the Boundary Commission, and he uh, had he was sent to negotiate with well to see Habibullah. Habibullah having refused to give him allow him to do with the Russians what the British would have liked him to do, and and it, he needed Habibullah's permission for that. But he managed somehow to keep on good terms, and then went to Kabul, where he had many audiences with Habibullah. And uh, uh, Habibullah and he um, had a lot of discussions. I, imagine, I cannot imagine what they talked about, since he was forbidden by India from saying anything of substance and was told to uh, keep all questions open and not, not discuss anything substantive. But, but he certainly did. And India had wanted Habibullah to make a visit to India. And after, well, after Dobbs came back, there was, first of all, the Dane mission at which Habibullah told the Louis Dane, who headed the mission, that he would find uh, Henry Dobbs a great assistance to him. And then after that, um, Habibullah was persuaded to go on tour through India, and Dobbs was in charge of his tour. And he did indeed um, have a uh, get on with him very well, although I think he nearly drove Dobbs demented because he didn't do any of the things he was supposed to do. He stayed on and on and on. He had an enormous retinue of people, thousands of people, and um, they had to be accommodated in camps, which Dobbs had to organize. But, uh, and also, as I say, he stayed on and on. And Dobbs' wedding was scheduled on the assumption that the um, Amir would have been back in, in Afghanistan months before. But he wasn't. And indeed, Dobbs wrote, I was so worried about everything, I couldn't even think about my wedding. <laughs> so, yes, he did have a... Very good relationship. Um, in the book, I think you reference that um, Bob's met and knew to you, Lawrence. Uh, are there any references by Lawrence to Dobbs? Uh, yes. Um, he thought Dobbs one of the most interesting people he met in Mesopotamia when he was visiting Mesopotamia. This is Lawrence. Sorry, this yes. is a question about Lawrence. I keep forgetting. Don't worry, I'm sorry to interrupt. No, no, it's good. I, I know, I know, people need to know. Um, but uh, subsequently, it was always said, although this is, a, I think, a story passed down in the family, that uh, Dobbs had said about Lawrence, if you promise as much, have very good relations with the Arabs. Question at the far end there. Thanks, Paul. your comparison between these are. Thanks. 
Well, the, the question is about the contrast between Dobbs' views on independence in India and Ireland. Um, it's quite a be. I'll be here all night, really, if I if I um, answered that fully. But I think in Ireland, part of it was, as I said, that he didn't. He wasn't really very familiar with the situation in Ireland. He did at one, and an example of that I would. I would mention is that he did at one time when, um, as Sarah said, all this was going on in Ireland, he uh, thought it would be, might be useful if he went back to Ireland and took a responsible position in the Irish government. Well, I sort of think that was the last thing the Irish government would have wanted at that moment, but it just illustrates that he wasn't really in touch with the Irish situation. And he, he drove independence in Iraq, I think, for, for a number of reasons, and partly really because he wanted to help the Iraqis achieve their aspirations. And you might say, well, why didn't he want to help the Indians? But I think he wasn't, he didn't have that sort of contact with the Indians in that way. And he also believed it would be in the best interests of Iraq and of Britain because it would lead to a positive relationship which would help Iraq to develop uh, and which also would bring benefits, economic benefits to Britain as well. Um, and so I think that's what uh, underlay his uh, views. And of course, it's also fair to say that while he was uh, doing things tactically and disobeying uh, British government to deliver what he saw as their policy aims, what were their policy aims. He was, after all, trying to implement British policy, and he thought that his approach was the best way of doing that. Hi, well, could I then just ask one last question, <laughs> um, which is you started your talk by really introducing us to us in a very personal way. And I think one of the things that you, you mentioned was that um, in this cache of, of private papers that you found, there were all those hundreds of letters to his mother and to his wife. And obviously you've drawn on them to a great extent. I just wonder, you know, that those relationships, you know, between his, well, with his mother, with his wife, whether the fact that he's writing to them, you know, to, to women that are very close to him, in any sense you feel sort of shaped or helps us to understand um, his his thinking in, in a way that maybe be different if he was right. I know it's a what if, if he was writing to someone else, but I just feel that those particular relationships seem to be so central to the, the record that he's left behind. Yes, I um this was a question about his relationship. Oh, they, oh, they oh, yeah, yeah, oh, um, <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> um, I um, I mean, it always it struck me that the letters that his wife really was a confidant, and it was almost the letters are almost to me like a, a telephone conversation might have been had it been easy to have such. Yeah but he didn't have anybody. And also being in a position of responsibility as he was, he had no one uh, with whom he could discuss quite a lot of the issues that came up. And so he wrote about them to his wife. And of course, he uh, also wrote about his, uh, he wrote to his mother, and I think he was a very beautiful son. And he clearly, um, knew that his mother would be pleased to hear good things about him. And I found it interesting that he's really a very modest man. Of himself, he didn't sort of broadcast what he'd done. And that's another reason I think why he's not very well known or hasn't been. But in his letters to his mother, that, that that's an exception. And he did, if I was being, um, rank about it. He did 
boast about what he'd done. Uh, and well, I think uh, they were what he claimed was was fair, but he was obviously, you know, writing writing for mother and what she'd be delighted to hear. And I I think it's very I'm very pleased to have that because he was such a modest person and so rarely said anything about what he himself had done that um, I think it's useful to have that uh, perspective on it. He gave an um, address in 1933 when he summed up uh, what had gone on in Iraq. He said absolutely or almost absolutely nothing, but well, nothing really about what he personally had done. And the comments at that time on what he personally had done came from Leo Amory and other people who were listening to the talk. Well, thank you. Um, again, on behalf of everyone, and um, it's been a wonderful talk, but it's obviously, you know, you've introduced us to the book, and I hope that it, you know, this gets all the attention that it deserves um, from a very wide readership. So thank you. Well, thank you very much. I don't know whether it's worth saying, but they are bringing out a paperback. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, that's a very good sign. Thank you again. Yeah, yeah. Not so far away now, unfortunately. <laughs> Please, um, <laughs> thank you, Anne, so much. Oh,